Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's show. The date is Wednesday, the 4th of March, 2020. We are now live on the Tim Wilms YouTube and DLive uh, channel. It's the Wilms Front episode you've all been demanding. Uh, plenty of you in the live chat uh, in previous shows have wanted me to discuss the federal government's proposed cash ban on cash transactions over 10,000 Australian dollars. We are told the cash ban is necessary in the fight against organised crime, but it sounds more like a ploy to push us into a cashless society where the banks and government can keep a log of all our digital transactions. I have been keeping up to speed with the what's it's called the the currency restrictions on the use of cash bill 2019. It uh, uh, just last Friday, uh, the Senate Economics uh, Committee released its uh, findings uh, on the bill. An economics expert who has been warning Australians of the significance and danger of the cash ban while the mainstream media has been ignored, ignoring it is Martin North, who runs Digital Finance uh, Analytics, uh, which is a, a website and a YouTube channel which has over 30,000 uh, th subscribers. Martin also covers the turbulence of global uh, stock markets, the mani manipulations of our currencies by central banks and all manner of speculative bubbles on his channel. He also hosts the Adams North Report with John Adams, who's a former coalition government advisor who I've interviewed previously. Martin, welcome to the show. Hi, good to be here. Uh, so we'll we'll start with the the rationale for the for the cash ban. It's, it seems to be the the responsibility of the assistant uh, treasurer Michael Suka uh, at the moment uh, to to basically make the the, the pitch uh, for this. I gave a, a a brief rationale for it, but can can you go into detail? <laughs> well, a bit of history first. So you need to understand that the cash ban uh, deposit bail in and some of the other things that are going on are all an agenda that was cooked up post the G20 meeting back in 2011. So after the global financial crisis, where effectively banks were uh, basically rescued by governments putting huge amount of taxpayers' money into them around the world, right? G20 were looking for an alternative. They didn't want to throw more public money at saving banks down the track. Now, one of the things that was recommended was that effectively uh, we should have more, there should be more controls and uh, the cash thing is part of that story. Now, there was also a black economy task force that ran in Australia a few years later. That was read, led by KPMG and a few other people. And the black economy task force basically incorporated the idea of a transaction cash bank. Uh, in their recommendations. And those recommendations were brought into Parliament by Scott Morrison when he was Treasurer. So Scott Morrison is all over this, this bill, uh, as is the G20. So that's the important context. So whenever um, people decide to resist this, we are resisting not only ScoMo, but also the G20. So that's important to understand, right? So the bill was introduced, the cash bill particularly, was introduced last year. And uh, the... Uh, Treasury were responsible for propagating it. They actually issued the draft bill on a Friday night at 5.30 p.m. with no, lay, no more than two weeks to put submissions in. And despite that, uh, I think they all hoped that no one would notice, we managed to get uh, 3,500 submissions into Treasury relating to the cash bill. And basically, the bulk of them were actually anti the bill. And we'll talk about why in a second, right? And then... Um, it went into the lower house, so they redrafted a little bit, but went into the lower house. The lower house voted it through in no November time. It then went to the Senate, and the Senate decided to hold an inquiry into the bill. And they, the inquiry received more than two and a half thousand submissions. So in both, you know, normally these submissions people receive twenty or thirty submissions, vast numbers of submissions, right? And the uh, bill was reported then um, back from the Senate last week with some sort of five or six key recommendations to make changes to the bill. But essentially, the cornerstone is that if those changes were made, it would be potentially actually introduced into law. But what this bill says is that it is not allowable to make any cash transactions above $10,000, period, in Australia. Right? That's what the bill says. And then there's a separate set of regulations that carve out specific exclusions. So, for example, there's an exclusion that says cryptocurrencies are okay at the moment. 
transactions between uh, of, of um, up to ten thousand uh, dollars and more are okay in the bank between a bank and a consumer <laughs> and a consumer in a bank, right? So, but those regulations are not in the bill. Those regulations can be changed at any time by the treasurer just struggling it out and saying, right, we're going to use something different, right? So the bill is banging, is banning all transactions with more than ten thousand dollars in cash now. It's being argued that this is to do with the black economy and uh, tax leakage. Actually, Australia has a very small proportion of its economy uh, that has tax, le tax leakage. And most of the tax leakage is not down at sort of $10,000 cash. It's more to do with multinationals. If you look at the big multinationals who don't pay their tax here, it's billions and billions and billions that don't pay, right? But nevertheless, they've chosen to focus on this, this narrow, narrow element. Now, the point about this is the rationale that they put out is it's all about tax leakage and tax minimization and cr clamping down on bikey gangs. That's what Suka says, right? Who's now responsible for it, as you said. But if you look carefully, go back to G20, go back to what I said, what, they, what I think they've got is a mechanism that if they needed to, in a crisis, in a banking crisis, they could essentially, if this bill was law, turn off cash withdrawals from banks. In other words, this is a mechanism that potentially has the opportunity of stopping money being whipped out of the banks in a crisis. Now, if you go back to 2008 UK, look at Northern Rock, one of the building societies over there. There were queues of people down the street all whipping out their money out of the Northern Rock because they were worried about its financial stability. Right? They didn't want this to happen again. That's what the G10 is on about. That's what this cash bin bill effectively can be about. So that's what this real agenda is. Now, the, the, the story, therefore, is that you've now got some politicians across the aisle who are very negative this bill and actually believe that it erodes civil liberties because at the moment you can actually use cash the way you want it. Post the bill coming in, you won't be able to use cash in certain ways. Uh, there are also other people who are arguing that it's to do with monetary policy and negative interest rates and all those sorts of things, right? So if you actually are persuaded by just the black economy arguments, the other point to make is that around the world, the cash level has tended to be dropping lower and lower. So rather, it might, it might be $10,000 now, but it could well be dropped lower later as well. In some countries in Europe where they've got a similar bill, it's 1,000 or 2,000 euros. So this is a way of controlling the money supply, controlling the way we use cash, eroding our civil liberties, and very importantly, building a trap which could be activated in the case of a financial crisis. And that's why I thought it was interesting that it came from the, the G20, because you and I both remember the, the global financial crisis. And uh, after that, there was the, the European banking uh, crisis, uh, which uh, affected uh, Greece and, and Cyprus. And obviously, with people worried about the bank's uh, liquidity is they want to uh, withdraw their money. And they, they, they introduced things such as extra bank holidays so that... Uh, the uh, you can't go to the bank and there's a limit on how much you can withdraw from the the ATMs because uh, just to a lot of people in the chat might know this as well we have a fractional reserve banking system where the the, the bank loans out uh, your money that it stores and that uh, gets deposited again and so it only has what is that ten percent deposit on hand. Uh, well, it depends whether you believe the fractional reserve theory of how banks work, right? So that's another, that's a whole other argument. We can go down that route if you want, because it's really important to understand that banks have the ability to create unlimited amounts of credit, right? It's not linked by the amount of deposits they have. Um, what happens is that they actually can create money out of thin air when they write a loan. Those loans then go and create assets or create deposits. Those deposits then go into the banking system, right? So this whole idea of that the banking system is limited in some way by those ratios and that fractional reserve is not actually, the fra in, fra in fact, the way banks work. Banks can grow for as long as people can be persuaded to borrow more from them. 
the reason why I mentioned it is because this is another reason why both the banks and the governments don't want people to withdraw uh, their money on a mass scale because then the banks go bankrupt yep. and the whole whole fractional reserve system of, of banking collapses. So, so that's right. Banks have to have assets and liabilities. So, you know, the, the loans on one side, the deposits on the other side, deposits and also other forms of funding, for example, bonds and those sorts of things, right? But they have to keep the, the two together. So the more they loan, the more they have to have um, the other side of the balance sheets. Now, if in fact people whip out a whole bunch of uh, uh, their savings from the banks, then their ratios go all over the place and then they can't lend anymore and get into liquidity um, uh, risk areas. And that's precisely the problem with, with this. So in a way, the cash ban is a way of trying, I think, to lock people into the banking system to protect the banks. And that has been ultimately denied again and again by even the Senate's inquiry refused to make that connection. So they're sort of going back to, no, 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 this is all about um, tax leakage and black economy, right? They're missing the, you know, the elephant in the room, which is monetary policy and the need to actually keep people within the banking system. And the real truth is that once you are in the banking system, the only way that you can transact then is digitally. Every time you transact digitally, you create a footprint, and that basically means that you can be tracked. You can people can understand precisely what it is that you're doing, and uh, you know it's a bit like um, uh, you know 1984. You know nothing is nothing is free because if you think about it, cash transactions, you know it's just notes, right? And there's no audit trail. But if you're actually making payments within the digital system, then you leave you leave a footprint, and that basically leaves open the control. Um, and worse. So that's another angle on this, right? So it's almost a, a strategy to push more and more into the digital world and to lock people into the digital system. And it's about surveillance and supervision and all those things. And in fact, China is a really interesting model because they've taken this a lot further. You know, you have things like social scores there and all those things. But basically, the financial system is much more controlled than here. But we have a heavily controlled financial system now. And the worry about the cash ban is it's just one more step taking away our freedoms again. Yeah, because it's privileging the the banks even more, which who issues the, the banking licenses, it's uh, the government. And of course, the the, the big four uh, banks, they want to, to, to retain their privileges and make sure that there's no uh, competition. And of course, uh, governments and we have the, the, the financial transactions regulator, Austrac, who do their credit, do uncover some uh, dirty deals uh, by, the, by the bank. But the government wants the ability, not that they're looking at it all, but the ability to basically go through someone's financial footprint. And it's easier if there's just four banks, which people are locked into. Well, there's no doubt that competitive um, dynamics around banking is, is worrying, right? So we have a large number of very small players and a small number of very large players. And in fact, APRA has some time ago said, it's much more convenient if we have all of our financial system in a small number of players that we can easily supervise, right? So, so, so you know, there, there is endorsement, if you like, at the centre of large is good and a small number is good, right? When, in fact, what, what we should be doing is encouraging significantly greater competition. The margins in Australia even now are a lot higher than most banks around the world. So Australian Inc. is paying very heavily, heavily for our uncompetitive, uh, you know, monopolistic type behaviours from the banking sector. And yet they're protected by government. They're protected by the Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank has something called the Committed Liquidity Facility, which basically says if banks get into issue in difficulty from a liquidity perspective, the Reserve Bank will support them and help them. And in fact, one of the reasons why the credit ratings of the banks here in Australia are so strong is because there is the belief that the banks will be absolutely supported by the government and by the Reserve Bank. Uh, one of the developments that we've covered here at the Unshackled is the the big banks, uh, primarily uh, ANZ and Westpac, uh, deplatforming de Patriots, shutting down their their bank account in uh, a clause in their their terms of uh, conditions. It's basically for for wrong think and. We have this cash ban coming in. We have, as as you just said, it's a deli it, it, everyone wants there to be these big privileged banks. And so if you get a deplatform from one of the, the banks for the wrong thing, uh, that is a, a serious 
hindrance on basically your your everyday life to uh, financially trade just to to buy things at the uh, the 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 grocery store even if there is a toilet paper the the banks will will cancel your card and obviously the uh stripe and paypal and other payment processes of uh, uh deep platforms all lots of people for wrong think mainly on the on the right and so this is basically consolidating it more where they uh, 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 they're basically keeping you in line that yeah you can't even go back to cash which is legal tender it says on that well so legal tender today is legal you know and you can tender with it but the cash bill will change that right and you're absolutely mm. right so th so there was evidence produced in the inquiry for the cash bill of uh, debanking in other words businesses being effectively uh, unable to continue because their banking services were being removed by the banks and they didn't have to give any explanation as to why it was that they were actually um, doing that there is no civil right to allow you access to the banking system it is a commercial relationship it's a commercial decision that uh, the banks make and their argument would be that if it's not commercially sensible for them to do it they won't do it and that means you know, commercially sensible from a profit perspective or from a moral perspective or from a political perspective. So we are already teetering on the edge of effectively the banking system have seen, having significant veto control over people being able to live, you know, a re reasonable life. And, and the fact is, if you can't use cash uh, and you are being forced into the banking system, right, you've got no choice, they have control. The other thing, of course, is they can charge you fees. Because if you think about it, if you pay with some of the online systems, then you may have to pay a fee. Or if you have digital accounts, they'll start charging you for them. So this is potentially another earner for the banks as well. So effectively, the more you're forced into the banking system, the more you're playing effectively their game, the more they're going to charge you, the more they're going to be in control, and the less flexibility and freedom we have as individuals. And it's interesting that some of the um, liberals, for example, down in, down in Melbourne, actually uh, have identified this freedom issue as the critical one. So basically they're saying this is anti-liberal. Liberals don't stand for this. They stand for individual freedom and flexibility and agility, all those good things. This is precisely the opposite. So effectively you could argue that the Morrison uh, government doctrinally has gone completely off the rails. Yeah, because the the Liberal Party now uh, does have a you'd call it a substantial uh, amount of classical liberal libertarian uh, MPs, uh, Tim Wilson, James Patterson, uh, come to mind, and this is the the ultimate restriction on on civil liberties, your ability to uh, 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 trade, do transactions in uh, legal tender. But you mentioned there that this was signed off by Scott Morrison. Uh, when when he was the treasurer, obviously Josh Frydenberg uh, is the the treasurer now. And you mentioned the the, the regulations which the treasurer can uh, change with the stroke of a pen. And if he's captured by his uh, treasury uh, department, uh, the bureaucracy already run the show most of the time. And if they capture a minister, uh, even uh, better for them. Uh, but it just shows that what the when uh, politicians get into to, to cabinet and that uh, uh, Scott Morrison himself talks about the political bubble well he there's this uh, backbench revolt hasn't uh, changed uh, his uh, cabinet's policy on this one iota no well there's actually a very interesting tussle going on so we know that there are a number of uh, liberals and nationals who are very anti this bill we also know that some of the Labour Party people are anti the Greens are against it one national one nation are very against it too but within his own party there are people who are against it but um, Morrison Frydenberg and Zucker have basically um, been holding the line and in fact uh, the the inside talk is that it's Morrison who's saying no we must do this of course he's the one who built it brought the bill in the in the first place and it goes right back to the reason is because it connects back to the g20 and the international agenda about um protecting the banking system from another financial crisis like 
a decade ago. And of course, the timing on this couldn't be more worrying given where we are over the last few days with all of the um, falls in the financial markets, the pressure on the banking system because of the coronavirus and the fact that probably some of their customers will have difficulty in repaying the loans they've got. I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons why this is almost a replay of the GFC a, a decade ago from a liquidity perspective. So, so this is really a very, very current issue. Um, and, and, you know, the, the worrying thing here is that many of the politicians have no idea. So even those who in the, voted for it in the, in the lower house, many of them had no idea that the penalty here is t up to two years in jail if you make a cash transaction above $10,000, right? That's the penalty. Uh, that's the most draconian, um, uh, you know, regulation compared with almost everybody around the world with regard to this. So, so that, and they've gone black letter. In other words, it's not about the circumstance. In other words, did you make a mistake? Have you done it several times? Um, it's basically, if you make a transaction more than $10,000 in cash, you can go to jail. Uh, now, uh, there, there would be people who would say, and it sort of feels like they're the old uh, assault rifle uh, argument, why do you need to make uh, cash transactions over $10,000? For example, ATMs, they, the, they only dispense $50 bills, even though we have $100 bills. And whenever we see somebody, a lot of people, when they see someone flash a $100 uh, greenback bill, they sort of, well, how did you get that? Uh, were you up to, up, to, up to something? So why is it necessary for, I, there's obviously the freedom principle argument, but also the practicalities as well. What may you like to purchase for more than 10,000 with cash? Well, yeah, so there are some areas. So if you go look up in some of the rural areas, for example, they don't have at the moment the ability to um, use electronic alternatives. So, you know, if they're buying cattle or selling cattle at a market, um, evidently, you know, cash is used quite often for that. It is also used, you know, so that there was actually an interesting evidence uh, uh, argument produced by the funeral directors of Australia who said, you know, it's amazing how many people save for their funeral, you know, notes over time. And then when they, when they die, they turn up with this big bundle of notes to pay for the funeral. <laughs> so there, there are lots of examples where cash is legitimately used. Now, I recognise that there will be a small proportion of people who are using cash for, you know, nefarious means and that sort of, sort of, sort of thing. But there are already regulations today that if they were enforced would actually restrict those sorts of um, transactions. You don't need another bill to do this, right? You just need the implementation of the, the current legislative frameworks that are already in place. Uh, and Andrew Wilkie in the lower house made the point when he was arguing against the, the bill, said, if you actually had been implementing and policing the current regulations that exist in Australia, you wouldn't need another cash ban bill, right? So, so it's about, you know, is this overkill? And yes, it is. And is it to do with this, you know, broader question of monetary and and, um, and, and control and that sort of thing? Yes, it is. But even if you stand back and just look at it as a single piece of legislation relating specifically to tra cash transactions, we know that there are many people who are used cash today quite legitimately. We know that there are many people who prefer to use cash rather than digital. And that's going to probably continue for some time. And there are circumstances, for example, we had the South Coast where we had the bushfires and all of the ATMs, ATM networks and all of the um, FPOS machines went offline for weeks. The only way you could buy anything in those areas was using cash. All right. So there is a very, very important role for cash, even in a case of emergency. Um, and so I think that we need to be very careful, not just to sort of be bounced into this very, very draconian environment where effectively cash is now illegal in certain circumstances. And if people are engaging uh, illegal in illegal activities with uh, transactions over over 10,000, uh, are they suddenly going to think, oh, I better not engage in this illegal transaction now because uh, now the, 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 the cash transfer itself would be illegal, which goes to your point, of course, uh, uh, agencies, uh, law enforcement, they're always wanting extra power, not because it will help them catch them, but it's basically they, they just want it there. Yeah, well, there's no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt that there is this sort of quest for power. And in fact, you could you could list a whole bunch of 
regulations over the last five years that have taken away more and more of our freedoms. Look at some of the digital um, changes that were made. Look at some of the uh, digital identity. Look at the um, the credit scoring system that's now in. That you know. So so little by little, our freedoms are being eroded, and, and frankly, I'm worried that we're just sleepwalking into you know a, a nightmare solution into the future where effectively every action that we take everything that we spend our money on is controlled and managed at the center and i'm very worried by that and i think that's something we should be resisting right first point second point is this ten thousand dollar limit thing right that's just a number plucked out of the air because the treasury in their in their um evidence to the senate said well we you know we didn't quite know where the where to set it we picked it because it was a convenient level right because it's the same as the austrack one but like I said earlier on, around the world, typically the cash ban limit gets dropped, right? One to two thousand euros. In other words, not ten thousand, but one thousand dollars, right? What would happen if it was one thousand dollars? Think how restrictive that would be, in terms of you know just day-to-day -day transactions. So, so the difficulty is that this is the thin end of the wedge, and yet, you know, frankly, many people have been. I think are ignorant of this. I'd also say that the mainstream media have hardly covered this at all. Uh, oh, yeah, right they've the been through. a disgrace on it. Yep. And yep. Uh, we just saw yesterday Australian Associated Press uh, announcing their, their closure and the, all these people sobbing on Twitter that uh, we won't get uh, impartial, important news anymore. But they've complete, there's been a report here and there, but there has been in no way a, a right. A, write up about how significant uh, if this bill passed it, it would be it's just like oh the uh, the senate uh, committee is considering this it's it's just sort of uh, basically page page 12 of the of the paper yeah well there's a few things to say there abc did do a, a, an article a few months ago but the journalist who did it got into terrible trouble because basically she took a stronger position than uh, the, the, than people wanted her to take um other than that, there's a guy called Aaron Patrick over at the AFR who's written three very, very disgusting articles, basically accusing uh, you know, this being a right-wing plot. Um, in other words, she let, let, let the cash ban come in. It's made perfectly sensible. Um, anybody who's resisting it is you know, a right-wing um, you know, plotter, etc., etc. Um, but, of course, the AFR is the, um, you know, the public organ of the, um, the banking system, so wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, Although, I, actually, I think I may have mentioned this, Alan Jones did do a very good a piece on Sky uh, yesterday where he basically was talking to Malcolm Robertson from the, um, uh, the One Nation Party who's resisted it. And um, Alan was right on song, highlighting all of the risks and issues around this and talking about you know civil liberties and talking about the issue of being trapped in the banking system and talking about the lack of um uh, civil liberties that effectively is, this would this would lead us to and you know kudos to him he finally he's kind of finally got got on song it's just six months too late yeah, Alan, uh, when he when he does get onto a an issue such as this, which is ignored by the the mainstream, he's incredibly uh, effective. They, they they talk about uh, his uh, his power is uh, overstated, uh, his his enemies, but uh, he has uh, led some important campaigns uh, over the years. And well, better better late than never. Well, you know, the more the merrier, right? And uh, the, the, the other interesting thing is we've got quite a few people internationally who are watching what's happening here in Australia. So there are some uh, very, very famous people who are now engaging <coughs> around this. And some of the posts that I've done on Walk the World, which is my YouTube channel, um, we've had a whole big audience, um, you know, 80, 90, 100 and something thousand uh, of people around the world and a lot of interest because this battle is actually not just representing Australia and Australians, but it's also a battle which potentially is going to be played out elsewhere around the world because this G20 logic is not just for an Australian banking system. It's for every banking system around the world controlled by the central bankers, controlled through the G20, controlled by the Financial Stability Board. And so other countries are watching with interest to what extent we, we battle this. It's also worth saying Germany tried to put this bill in about four or five years ago and ultimately, it was rejected because one of the main papers, the newspapers in Germany, came out against it and basically ran a very effective campaign and it was derailed. Most other places across Europe have 
this legislation in place now. And, you know, it is very interesting to see that in other countries where it's not yet in, but there is talk about it being brought in, Australia is being held out as a bit of a case study. Uh, will the cash ban apply to uh, political donations in Audi bags? <laughs> no, politicians are exempt. Yes, because uh, when uh, we've seen constantly when when they're caught uh, with their expenses, they say, oh, it was technically within the rules or, or guidelines. I, I get confused what's the difference between rules and, and guidelines. And everyone rightly points out that if we uh, did that, uh, we'd be before the courts. Yep. No, there's one rule for them and one rule for everybody else, right? The fact of the matter is that there are specific carves out in the bill, right? So any, anybody in the political environment, any, anything in, in public life, basically, no, you can do whatever you like, right? It's, really? It's the, That's it's, actually, I was just making a joke, but that actually is in there. It is. Absolutely, it is. It is. Oh. Absolutely. So, and so basically, if you are, you know, a small business, right, or if you're an individual and, you know, you actually want to pay in cash over $10,000, won't, you won't be allowed to. But if you're in a political party or if you're in the, you know, political establishment, not a problem. Oh. Another thing's come to mind uh, when the the good guys, the electrical retailer, launched. Uh, their their slogan was uh, "Pay cash and we'll slash the prices," because obviously mm. there's no merchant uh, fees there. And I remember this was way way back in in 2008 when I bought my uh, my first uh, flat screen HD. Uh, HDTV. I, I paid for for that uh, uh, in cash. So I guess uh, that sort of uh, deal where you. Uh, both the, the good guys uh, in in both senses of the word, uh, that sort of uh, deal, cutting out the middleman, is, is going to be gone. Well, if it's over, if you're getting a TV that's over $10,000. Well, it, no, that's the whole point. So basically the idea is that people do pay cash sometimes and it's a negotiating ploy, right? Because you can actually sometimes get a better deal because, as you say, there are no merchant fees that... Uh, that need to be paid. Now, the argument that the other side will put is, well, if you're paying cash, just, you know, let's say you have a tradesman turn up and fix your roof, right, and you offer to pay cash, um, does that tradesman then actually declare that revenue um, when, they, when he does his accounts? But my argument is that's not, that's not the person who's paid's problem, that's the tradesman problem, right? Because basically you are policing effectively um, you know, one thing to try and solve another problem. Clearly, if the audit and the count of that particular business is done right, then that would be picked up. So, so trying to effectively put the acid back on the individual um, for something which is relating to the way that the tradesman work, runs his own business, to me, is, mis is misplaced. Uh, you mentioned that the, the cash ban doesn't apply to, to cryptocurrencies, which are mm. uh, completely uh, decentralized. So uh, the Oztrack, uh, e even if they wanted to, it's, it's, it's a lost cause. Uh, but uh, before we had crypto, there was the, as they're called, the, the gold bugs, uh, because uh, if you or had stocks in gold or actually had uh, gold and precious metals because it guards against inflation uh, gold always always goes up but there have been instances in the past where, where governments have actually banned gold uh, franklin roosevelt uh, during uh, great depression world war ii uh, did that uh, what is the 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 status of of that in australia precious metals yeah it's a good question and uh, you know there is an act in australia the 1959 act which says that the government can confiscate gold at any time at any price i just put that in the back of your mind right so basically that what the, what it says is that um uh if you're using gold for um uh you know things like jewelry and those sorts of things that isn't included but if you're using it as a medium of exchange in other words actually as a currency potentially it could be caught there is no clarity at the moment in the legislation precisely about that the carve out so those regulations it sort of mentions it a little bit but not specifically and it's not in my view it's it's not very clear as to whether gold is or isn't included. Cryptos, uh, at the moment, it is carved out, and they basically said, well, at the moment, cryptos is relatively small as a proportion of total transactions, so therefore we'll exclude it. But they left the door open that if cryptos, cryptos start to take off, then they can apply the same transaction ban to cryptos as they can to other types. doesn't need to change the law because the crypto is actually in the regulation, which can be trade changed uh. by the treasurer at any time. So cryptos aren't safe. I don't think gold is safe uh, and other precious metals. 
and uh, you know it is just showing you that this is you know tentacles getting around lots of different parts of society. Uh, well, if the, if they can confiscate your gold at any time, do they have to? Uh provide monetary comp uh, compensation or did they just at whatever price they want so it's not similar a, it's, to... it's not at a market price uh, now let's uh, move on now to uh, we, we've talked about the the, the big banks and but uh, let's talk about the the central banks uh, mm. now obviously you mentioned Reserve Bank of Australia uh, which issues uh, Australia's currency and also sets uh, interest rates. And uh, the uh, Reserve Bank uh, of Australia, which is independent uh, from uh, government, uh, lowered uh, our interest rates yet again to 0.5%. They said to, to basically uh, uh, make sure the economy keeps floating along with the uh, corona uh, virus uh, panic that is, is sweeping the the nation at the moment, which they're worried uh, will uh, lead to a recession next quarter. But the Reserve Bank also said previously that they were considering taking matters into their own hands uh, uh, to uh, introduce what the, the US Federal Reserve has done for, for decades, quantitative easing, which is, is just a nice word for printing money, inflating the money supply and robbing us of our wealth. It's called the, the secret tax uh, inflation uh, to, to prop up the uh, economy uh, th uh, through that. And we know that Trump has been in his re-election year is wanting the, the Fed. He, he actually tweeted today he wants them to, uh, uh, to, to keep uh, cutting and easing. Yeah, so this whole issue of central banks and their role is one that concerns me greatly because essentially the central banks ostensibly are independent but aren't really. I mean, in the US, the Federal Reserve is a privately owned institution owned by the major banks. So it's not a government entity, right? The RBA in Australia is not the same structure at all. It is actually a public entity. So it's part of the government structure. So if you think about it, you've got Treasury and the government over here, you've got the Reserve Bank. They all sit around the table, by the way, in this thing called the Council of Financial Regulators with ASIC and APRA. So that, that you know, the idea of them being independent is nuts. They are actually all part of this same cabal at the centre, right? And, and so they are basically calling the shots in terms of monetary policy and other things. Um, the quantities of easing which has been going on for a long, long time, where, as you say, they basically buy assets, and that can be treasury bills, bonds, it can be mortgage-backed securities. In Japan, they, they buy stocks and shares from the stock market as well. So, you know, the balance, the banks, the central bank's balance sheet gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, as a result of that, they basically create more liquidity, which goes back into the banking system, increasing the money supply. That means that effectively the value of everything is degraded. So effectively, whilst you know, the, the value goes up, it's actually degrading it. Um, so, you know, there are more millionaires today than there was a decade ago, but everything's just more expensive. So it's it's an illusion. It's not real. Right. So so what we're actually doing is we're devaluing the effective value of the currency that we've actually got at the moment. So effectively, that's the first point. The second point is there is no limit to the amount of quantitative easing that can be done until the currency is derailed by it. And um, you might like to know that the Fed has, in the last six months, increased their balance sheet by 600 billion, right, in, a, in six months. Um, that balance sheet is now as big as it's pretty much ever been and will continue to grow as they take interest rates lower. So we're on this sort of doom loop of lower interest rates, more quantitative easing. And if you look at Japan and if you look at the um, European Union, where they've been at this a long time, in Europe, the interest rate baseline is below negative. So effectively, the central bank is charging banks when they hold money at the central bank. And in Germany now, retail deposit holders are being charged to hold deposits in the banks. That's where it takes us, right? And what's interesting is that as interest rates come down, banks find it harder and harder to lend because they can't make a turn on the margin between deposits and, uh, and loans. So they're less likely to lend rather than more likely to lend. And in fact, what the banks end up doing is doing more speculative deals in the derivatives market 
or more speculative deals around wealth management because there are actually better returns to be made there. So there was a report published quite recently by the Bank for International Settlements that said these low interest rates aren't working and it's creating more financial pressure in the banking system. And yet the Fed's still doing it, the Bank of England's still doing it, Bank of Japan's doing it, we're about to start doing it. It's absolutely nuts. And it's because central banks have groupthink. They have this model as the way that the economy works, which is wrong. And essentially, they just keep printing more and more and more, lifting the value of everything and creating no value. And real households are being hit. So, you know, if you look at depositors, they're getting almost nothing now. These days, it's very hard for depositors to get any sort of return. There are three million households in Australia reliant on deposits for income to live and they are being squeezed. Um, OK, mortgage holders can actually get a mortgage with a lower interest rate, but that inflates house prices. So one of the reasons why we've got a house price bubble in Australia is because the lending has been so loose. People can get big mortgages. As they get big mortgages, it pushes house prices up. That then inflates bank balance sheets, which allow them to lend more. And so this sort of virtuous cycle or vicious cycle, depending on how you look at it, is, is there as well. And central banks... Uh, are not controlling the money supply. Their central banks are not controlling interest rates correctly. And uh, that's why we're in the situation that we're in. And it's a one-way street. So nobody has figured a way to go the other way, to start putting interest rates up. Because if you start putting interest rates up, then basically people will get into huge difficulty in terms of the debts they've got. And the Fed a couple of years ago tried to put rates up, did it for a few months. The market then started crashing and they were forced to reverse course and were now are now cutting rates again. So the markets, big banks, are actually in control of this. And I think that the central banks probably are not so powerful as perhaps they think they are. So they think they're omnipotent and can just uh, you know print more and cut rates. The truth is that this is actually a one-way street to nowhere. Uh, the Austrian School of uh, Economics, uh, they, they've uh, developed what's uh, known as the the, uh, the Austrian theory of the, the business cycle, which also uh, to, uh, we've, we've talked about the, the, the fact that uh, inflation robs ordinary households, uh, privileges, uh, the banks and the and the, the stockbrokers. But the idea of uh, printing money is to, to, to keep the, the economy growing but uh the austrian business cycle theory says that uh as you said it's a phony boom and they, they use the analogy that you think you've got all the materials to to build a house uh, but you actually don't and you halfway through and you realize oh i don't have this the house house can't be completed and by the central banks printing more money, uh, inflating, keeping interest rates low. It just uh, it just uh, delays the the crash, and in fact makes it even worse. And the Austrians believe that even if a a credit squeeze, as it's called, raising the rates uh, dramatically, uh, even though there is short term pain and it can cripple a lot of people, the economy resets and. In, even in six months' time, the economy can have a natural boom again, which does not fake. Yeah, well, so what's happened is that we should have had a correction in 2008. We never have it. We never, we never got the real correction we needed, right? The, the central banks around the world and the Fed particularly basically have been supporting this momentum for another decade. And what we've now got is a bigger set of crises, a bigger set of issues. So we've got this bigger and bigger and bigger problem. We've pulled a whole bunch of um, investments forward and people buying when they should have been buying, you know, five years down the track. So we've created this completely um, disequilibrium in the marketplace. Um, and if you look at real businesses, real businesses aren't investing. The stock markets are up because firms around the world are borrowing cheap and then they're buying back their own shares to lift their share price. This is why the stock market's rising. They're not investing in real good you know, development for the future. So effectively, we are creating this financialization of the, the, the banking system, the financialization of um, the business community. And uh, this is a one-way street to, to nowhere. And uh, the problem is central banks think they've got this all under control and they think they're you know, fine. But look at the repo markets. Look at what the Fed is still doing, right, despite the fact they thought it was just a little blip last September. $600 billion later, they're still writing more because they can't stop. 
And I mentioned uh, Trump. He's openly encouraging the the, the Fed to to cut uh, and ease. And this is the other thing that uh, the the politics of the day also influencing monetary policy because Trump has uh, made he uh, uh, the 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 vast uh, pitch of his his reelection that the economy is booming, uh, unemployment is low. Uh, but he knows that if there's a recession. Uh, he's cooked. He'll be he'll be blamed for it. His uh, credibility for the last four years will be uh, wiped out. And he, uh, Trump, might know this deep down in himself that this bubble is unsustainable. But he wants to be get, be reelected to become a two term uh, president. And this sort of uh, reelection strategy has been used before by by U.S. Uh, presidents uh, Nixon uh, in 72, uh, where uh, uh, we were talking about gold before. Gold uh, used to be uh, uh, tied to, well, gold backed up the, the paper money. Uh, Nixon severed in uh, 72 the, the, the Bretton Woods Accord, the final uh, link that uh, the U.S. dollar had to, to gold, and that was basically to secure his re-election in in 72, which he did, so there would be this uh, phony boom. And what happened a year later, OPEC, and then there was the age of Aquarius, the uh, inflation and unemployment stagflation, as it was called. Yeah. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is that the way that the central banks and the governments around the world have been running the economy for the last decade plus, um, it is myopic. Uh, it is very much a case of just by saying, let's cut taxes. So if you look at corporate taxes, they've been cut around the world. Trump cut big in the US to, you know, stimulate the economy. Um, the consumer data in the US is not bad. So there is there's still some evidence of consumer spending and wages are moving a little higher. So that that's good. But like I said, the real issue is that a lot of the corporates there are zombies. They're actually just growing simply because they're borrowing cheap and buying back stock so it's not real and i wouldn't be surprised if trump announces another um policy before um the election in the next few months you know maybe in relation to coronavirus to say what we should do is actually take taxes even lower because that will be another stimulus and another sort of sugar hit which could actually come in just at the time ahead of the election as you're right though if in fact the economy is tanked is tanking in September, October, November, um, he's going to have great difficulty in being re-elected. Now, there has been speculation, forecasts and fears of a Australian recession and a, a global uh, recession. Mm. Uh, Australia's Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, today uh, released the, the last quarter uh, economic uh, figures, which ends in December, which the, the economy grew by 0.5%, uh, which is... Uh, racks up 29 years of uh, consecutive uh, growth of the Australian economy because we haven't had a recession since uh, 1991, uh, Paul Keating's, uh, the recession uh, that we we had to have. But obviously that doesn't uh, count in uh, January when the bushfires really hit and, of course, uh, coronavirus. And uh, we were mentioning the... Uh, Australian uh, Reserve Bank sort of stepping in to, because they, Frydenberg and Morrison, they don't want to blow the budget surplus. They announced it last year. The politics of it, they they know that Wayne Swan in 2012 announced uh, announced four years of surpluses happening, and so they don't want to do what Wayne Swan did. But then the bushfires have happened, and then the uh, Corona. Uh, virus and now they're talking about a balanced budget, maybe a, a slight uh, deficit. There, there's been intense pressure, uh, a lot of it from the media and the commentariat, for them to blow the budget surplus. Uh, just to to to, uh, to fill our audience in on why a, a budget surplus is uh, so important, because well, even was it Dick Cheney, the Republican vice president, said back in the 2000s, deficits. Uh, don't matter. So why are surpluses important and low low debt? Yeah, well, that's interesting. I mean, it's 
it was, as you say, it became an iconic thing, right? And in fact, if you think about it, six months ago, they didn't think they were going to win the election, right? So in a way, saying we're going to end up with a surplus next year was an easy thing to say because basically they probably expect to be in opposition. And then suddenly, bingo, they, <laughs> they weren't. They were actually um, in power. So, so that's the first point to, to make. Um, the second is that there is a fundamental debate going on. And you, on one end, you've got the people called MMT, so the modern monetary theorists, who basically say, look, don't think of governments the same way as households. Governments can create as much debt as they want if it can be created for useful purposes. Um, for example, um, universal income is one that they're quite keen on. Uh, another one is to actually stimulate um, so that everybody can get a job if they want to get a job. Those are some other platforms. Bernie Sanders in the US is running on MMT type um, sort of doctrines at one end of the spectrum through to the other that says actually the thing about deficits is you ha you have to borrow if you're borrowing then you have to pay it back firstly and secondly you have to pay it back at interest now interest rates are very low at the moment so people would argue that with interest rates so low governments can actually borrow big and it's not an issue so maybe it's a good time to borrow others will say no 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 no. we still have to get back to a balanced budget because that gives us agility and flexibility and a bit of uh, insulation if we have a crisis um, we have a crisis now of course and uh, I suspect they'll have to go into deficit to um, do some of the rescue work that needs to be done because there are lots of businesses at the moment with cash flow issues they're just not getting money through the door because they can't sell their products they can't manufacture their products because they can't get the uh, supply chains to work um, that means that if those businesses go under or slow they'll stop paying income uh, they'll stop paying wages and there was income to their employees and that will then have a significant negative impact on the broader economy so so it's tricky times um, I don't think that um, Frydenberg and Morrison really in their hearts now believe they will get a surplus even a small one they might do uh, nobody quite knows how long the coronavirus thing's going to go on for my own view is this is going to be months not weeks this is going to be definitely negative for GDP and um, it could be that we see the, um, the, the, you know, the negative. But the other point to make is that we have 300,000 new migrants coming to Australia each year. And on that basis, it is blooming hard to have a recession number as a GDP number because the economy is being inflated all the time with more people coming in and more people working. And so there's, that's one of the key reasons. And in fact, the... Um, uh, one of the big feds in the, the, the St. Louis Fed in the US did a paper quite recently that said Australia will never have a recession. And the reason Australia will never have a recession is because migration is so strong. And so we could argue that our QE for the last decade plus has not been the same as in other countries. It's been driven by strong levels of migration to inflate the number of people working, to inflate you know everything and frankly that's why we've got so much congestion in sydney melbourne and elsewhere right it's part of the the, the ongoing um sort of problem we have and if you look at per capita metrics like per capita gdp that's 0.2 this 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 quarter this last quarter um per capita metrics are nowhere near as good as the total number because effectively we're growing the pie because of migration but it's not necessarily an effective pie so so those are some of the things to, to bear in mind my own view is it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to end up with a surplus when we come to the may budget you raised uh, an important point there because our high uh, annual migration uh, intake uh, we've talked about Q uh, qe uh, but you could call this pe people uh, easing we're inflating our, our gdp through our migration intake and governments love it because they uh, pay tax and yep. it, it props up the, the the budget but it's like a, a ponzi scheme as well because you mentioned the congestion in sydney and melbourne obviously gladys berejikli and daniel andrews say we've built uh, all these schools and hospitals and roads and uh light rail <laughs> which is that, that that's been uh, su such a success uh, but that's only to keep up with uh, the people coming in and of course this is we've also got an aging population it's completely unsustainable a ponzi scheme is where uh, people pay in and the money's moved there's no real return uh, on investment and so this is another uh, crisis and with the coronavirus with the travel ban from china uh, of course that's that's going to significantly hit us 
Yeah, so I mean, I've done some modelling on the economic impact of uh, coronavirus and it's significant. Um, you know, education, of course, is badly hit. Tourism is badly hit. But the real issues has to do with supply chains. People can't get the um, the parts they need to build things, and they can't ship those to other places to sell them when they're completed. So this is a this is a huge, complicated, you know, a very very wicked problem. Um, the other point that's worth just reflecting on is that we've known about a lot of this dependency on China for a long, long time. So if you look at the way that our economy works, we are very strongly linked to China, whether it's iron ore, whether it's coal whether it's um, you know agricultural uh, sector things too. And so there's this real problem that we've got this very strong uh, link that's been created. And I think we've been made too dependent, firstly. Secondly, our industry is very narrowly based. So effectively, we you know build up, uh, dig up minerals and chuck them across to China. We do a lot of services stuff, but services stuff is not necessarily value adding relative to uh, some of the other things. Our manufacturing base has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And uh, we don't have an economy, therefore, that is actually very well balanced at all. Highly exposed in terms of its base, highly exposed in terms of uh, the, the markets. And it's quite likely that we're going to see significant negativity ahead. The other point here is the migration is interesting. I'm doing an interview today, in fact, which will go up on my channel, Walk the World, probably tomorrow or the next day, with an academic who said, do you realise that migrants are young when they come in? But once they're here, they have a tendency then to bring their parents in and mm. they bring the rest of their family in. And so what you end up doing is, whilst the initial migration is quite young and positive, later the migration actually changes and you end up with more older people who need to be supported. So in fact, from a overall value, uh, correct, you know, connecting perspective, you get initial value with young people coming in and working for not very much. But in fact, the fact they then bring in a whole bunch of other people and hangers on means that we actually end up with a, di a demographic problem. We've already got a diabolical demographic problem as people age already, and it's going to get worse. So to my mind, we should be looking very hard at this whole migration model. A lot of people have talked about uh, with the, the the coronavirus impact uh, that this is the downside of globalization, which we've been told for uh, for, for so long so long has been the the, the way of the the future, comparative uh, advantage, and obviously there's the the other extreme, which is autarky, where you uh, produce everything uh, yourself, which is also uh, un, unsustainable. Obviously, it is good to trade globally, but we didn't need need to lose all our manufacturing. A lot of that was shooting ourselves in the foot uh, with uh, regulations, red and green tape, uh, the, the, the unions uh, demanding uh, too, uh, too much. And the same with our agriculture and water. Like The drought that we have is a man-made drought. The farmers know how to work the land, but we've crippled them and climate policy comes into this uh, as well so we certainly haven't uh, helped ourselves and we've made ourselves become more exposed because we don't use the minerals that we have we export it overseas yeah well i've said quite often we're a one-trick pony right we dig it up ship it out rather than actually add value and if you think about our strategy you know they rescued holden what a few years ago put huge amounts of money into holden right to maintain the existing manufacturing uh, base in Australia that didn't work, what they should have done was to invest in manufacturing uh, base for electric cars. So there's no future alignment and orientation to the strategies that have been executed for the last 20, 30 years. So we've become more and more dependent on, you know, last uh, centuries, industries and ways of thinking. And yeah, you don't want to manufacture everything here because of course, the, you know, there's benefit, benefit in specialism and benefit in, in, in centers of gravity around expertise, but we need enough of a base to be able to actually build value for the future because at the moment that value is being massively eroded and unfortunately the political cycle is too short so effectively they can just throw a little bit of money at a problem and then you know, hopefully get re-elected rather than taking a more strategic view. So my own view, I'm a philosopher by training and I stand back and say what we're missing is a strategic plan for Australia. We should have had that 20, 30 years ago that laid out effectively a vision for where we want to get to rather than just this incremental iterism approach which basically has led us to narrowing our manufacturing base, narrowing our industrial base, being more dependent on just a very small number of industries, 
dependent on a very small number of countries. And um, you know, the globalization wave, as you say, is not all positive. Um, neither, I think, is turning up completely off. You know, look at Trump, what Trump is doing in places too. There is a balance, but we need a strategy, and we don't have a strategy. We have a lot of very short-term tactical things, and I think that's probably the biggest problem. I'm not sure that strategy and government actually should be in the same sentence. I mean, look at the the ultimate uh, manufacturing uh, disaster that we've had, which is the uh, in defence uh, procurement with the the building of the, the the next submarines, and obviously that was highly politicised as well. But now there's problems with the sourcing of uh, of parts and that, and we've had a a horrid history of defence procurement. The, the the helicopters that were built in the 2000s they couldn't fly uh, uh, when it rained, and well. Uh, a lot of people talk about the US military industrial complex. We, or well, ours is non existent. You need it to a degree. We, we can't even make our, our own military equipment, which is why we're so dependent on the, on the US for foreign policy. Well, that's right. And another one is oil. You know, we don't now refine oil here in Australia, right? And so, do you know what our strategic supply is? How many days we have before? So if, if we got cut off in the Middle East, how long it would be before we actually ran out of fuel here? It's less than 100, isn't it? <laughs> it's, about, it's about a month. Okay. Which is, well, <laughs> the thing is with the, the toilet paper at the moment, we make that here in Australia with oil. It's, it's, uh, as you said, uh, if there's a panic on that, then uh, it's, it's not just a, a shortage because it's overseas, but it's also a, a geopolitical uh, strategic disaster. Yeah, and basically what Morrison has done, he's negotiated quietly with the US that the US would probably bail us out with some oil if we got into trivially. But, you know, that's, that, that's not a good policy. And again, it's, it's lack of strategic thinking, right? We just keep giving up little areas and, and basically just looking for the cheap dollar and the cheap solution rather than actually drawing the, 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 the bigger picture. You know, Australia was known as being a very innovative and very creative and very problem-solving based country years ago and we somehow seem to have lost that ability unfortunately and um, I think that's a, that's going to cost us a lot and I do believe that we need different strategies I personally think there's room for um, an investment bank maybe it's owned by the government or at arm's length from the government but invest specifically in new capabilities to be able to create if you like the next generation of industrial base in Australia because without it um, we're not going to go anywhere very far. The trouble is that the commercial banks aren't interested in that because the risks are too high so we need a different funding model I think. We need a different commercial model and we need a different strategy to support it. Don't we have something sort of like that with the future fund that uh, Peter Costello uh, set Yeah but up? no the future, the future fund is all about um, paying for civil servants pensions. That's all it is. <laughs> I mean, th they invest in various things, but there's very little, you know, there's very little strategic investment in, 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 in really exciting new, new things. Um, it, it's all about creating an income stream so that uh, super, superannuation for civil servants can be paid. Uh, the U.S. Uh, since the, I mentioned before the the 1973 uh, OPEC oil crisis, when that was when energy independence was was first talked about and the United States says has nearly uh, got there and they they are open open now the the deep state neocons that yes all those wars were uh, blood uh, for oil and when there was the 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 dr uh, Iranian drone attack on the Saudi oil uh, facility because everyone knows that uh, they're the biggest oil producers there Trump basically said uh, d uh, don't panic, uh, the US uh, uh, were able to keep up with the, the supply of oil and there, there wasn't a huge spike in the, uh, the price. Uh, but uh, obviously you, you mentioned our uh, lack of energy I independence and uh, Iran uh, in the middle of last year seized uh, British oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz and Australia sent uh, freedom of navig or contributed to freedom of navigation exercises in the Strait of Hormuz because well our our, our foreign policy experts knew that that was important uh, for us. Yeah, so you got to uh, decode what's going on there. There's a political agenda which is about power 
and who's actually asserting what power where. And then there's the economic agenda, right? Now, of course, the US is now self-sufficient on oil, so they don't need to worry about it for themselves. Um, they, but they also know that it's important to keep the supply chains open for the, for the broader economy. Um, I think that we're not being told the full story here as to what's going on there. And I have to say that I think there's been at least two or three generations of very bad policy in the Middle East. Um, all of the ructions that we continue to see um, is actually not um, the US trying to sort of pour, quote, oil on troubled waters. They've been part of the problem. Uh, so I, I'm less... Um, optimistic than many in terms of what we're seeing there. I think this is going to be a, a, a troublesome area for a long, long time to come. And um, what I would say, of course, is that if, in fact, the um, future is less oil intensive because of climate change, and it probably will be, that could change the geopolitical uh, landscape significantly. So I guess short term, there will be a lot of self-protectionism. Longer term, I wouldn't be surprised to see that changing. And it's interesting, of course, that OPEC and non-OPEC countries are talking now about reducing the oil supply to try and lift the oil price, which has dropped dramatically in the last couple of weeks. It's now sort of mid-40s rather than uh, mid-50s. So they still have some influence and the ability to exert influence. But my feeling is over time, that's going to pale away. Hey, uh Petrol uh, in Australia was I filled up last night a uh, dollar twenty five uh, a litre, which is is quite uh, cheap to to what it has been. So uh, that obviously uh, your uh, analysis there is is true in real life. You mentioned uh, protectionism and uh, Trump. He he ran on a on a platform that uh, the the trade agreements uh, uh, that we had uh, are unfair. He initiated the trade war. Uh, with China, he renegotiated NAFTA, the, the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement, and it's now uh, US, US uh, MCA, United States, Mexico, uh, Canada uh, Agreement, which everybody seems happy with. Even Nancy Pelosi said that, yes, we can't wait to get this ratified. Uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders said, well, it's still not perfect, but uh, it's it's better. Uh, obviously, the the traditional free market view is these trade wars are destructive. Uh, they they disadvantage uh, local uh, producers, agriculture. Uh, how do you see the uh, uh, Trump's initiation of the trade wars? And he has concluded it with with China with a new agreement. Well, no, he's concluded step one, right? So he's done the easy stuff, right? Um, and that was probably something which was, you know, it took some negotiation, but they haven't really touched the really hard stuff. But I also think Trump had a point insofar that the landscape between China and the rest of the world was very uneven with regard to things like um, copyright laws, to things with regards to the various tariffs in and out. So he has moved the, moved the dial a little bit. But I'm not sure that he's really addressed the fundamental structural issues that actually it represents. And there's also, you know, nobody quite wants to go there because there is a symbiotic relationship still between China and the US if you look at the amount of trade backwards and forwards. Um, so I think he's got some brownie points, but not many. And look, my, my perspective on all of this is global trade is part of the way the planet works but people don't necessarily understand the full consequences of that they don't understand what it means in terms of the economic flows and in terms of where you know where wages are going one of the reasons why wages are so low is because it's cheaper to get somebody in china to do it rather than uh, you know pay for it locally so there are definitely a lot of uh, uh, issues to, to to worry about i suspect that we will find that trump will be quite quiet with regard to the China trade at the moment because of the coronavirus. Um, but if he gets back in after the next election, I would expect a second round. And there they will start tackling some of the more complex issues that will be very difficult to solve. And remember that this is ultimately a geopolitical battle. And it's a battle for who's top dog between the US and China. And I think it's not unfair to assume that China is on the ascendancy, even coronavirus uh, accepted. US is probably on the descendancy. And so who's going to be top dog in 20 years' time? It's more likely to be China and India than the US, in my view. Uh, so what should Trump uh, initiate in this phase two, in your view? Well, I think that there is there's this important question about 
what China is tending to do is to basically steal ideas from other countries and then create cheap copies of them and basically then flog them, right? And, you know, you could argue that Huawei is an example of that. Now, they've taken it further now and they've actually started innovating themselves. But initially, that's how Huawei started, right? And so the, the issue is, can you get international agreements around ideas and how ideas are actually um, commercialized? That's the first point. The second point is that tariffs and markets need to be open both ways. And, and so that means that China needs to be uh, more open with regard to its own markets. And yet, of course, it has a very different doctrinal position with regard to market access and market control relative to the US. I'm not sure how they can square those two different worldviews. Um, maybe they're, they are incompatible. And then the third thing to bear in mind is that China has its Belt and Roads Initiative which is essentially extending influence out through into Asia, down into uh, areas of Europe and Africa and beyond, uh, and uh, across you know broader Asia too. I think the US are quite concerned about that because what it is doing is giving Asia influence and control, China influence and control across many geographies that traditionally would they would not have reached into. So you know they've got these massive roadways and you know all of that sort of stuff. I don't know whether that is negotiable or not, but I suspect that the US will have something to say about that because as a sphere of influence, and that's what this is ultimately about, it's a sphere of influence and who wins the sphere of influence, that's what this ultimate discussion is about at a meta level. And of course, uh, we should also add into this discussion that uh, China is not a, a free market uh, economy. It's heavily state controlled, is a communist uh, dictatorship, uh, which also influences the, the, the trade uh, policy. So it's not like Australia and the United States uh, trade agreement and economics also a, a, a goes into geopolitical considerations uh, as well. And as we've yep. seen that uh, a, if we're too dependent on globalization, then some government can basically cripple, cripple a nation in well, 30 days, as you said before. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there, is a, there is a fundamental philosophical difference between the way China does things and the way the US does things. Um, I'm not sure it's as black and white as, as many portray. I think there are examples where the US exerts its muscle and you know pushes its ideas very, very hard. Same with China. Um, both are quite controlling. Both are actually um, in name calling the other quite often. Um, I almost put them side by side and say they've got very strong common characteristics. Um, there is a different political system under, underpinning it, but I don't see them as polar opposites, as some do. I think there are some very strong commonalities, and in a way, that's part of the the challenge in terms of the when they try and engage, because they are quite similar in many ways. Well, I've enjoyed uh, your uh, excellent uh, economic uh, analysis uh, tonight, Martin. So has our audience uh, as well. One of them said, uh, you're the best guest uh, that uh, I've ever had uh, uh, on <laughs> Wilms Front. Uh, I, I am uh, looking for a, a resident uh, economics expert to have uh, on Wilms Front. You might be the, uh, the man uh, if you've uh, enjoyed and want to come back on. Yeah, well, no, I'm very happy to. I mean, I spend quite a lot of my time on this stuff. Um, let me just uh, tell the, your audience that there is a, my channel, Walk the World, where there's more than a thousand shows that we've created over the last few years. And then my other channel is called In the Interest of the People, and that's with John Adams, and that's where we talk about the cash ban and those things. So if you want to check out those channels, feel free. But yeah, I'm happy to come back and spend a bit more time and you know answer some questions and look at this stuff. What I, what I believe is really important is to give people exposure to different ideas, different concepts. I'm not saying I know all the right answers, but I'm happy to explore things. And as a philosopher, I'm very interested in the underbelly of ideas and what's really driving them. So if that's relevant to, to you and your audience, I'm very happy to come back. Well, that's what this show is. It's an exploration 
show and because we've got this extended format uh, we're not on mainstream media we've got to go to an ad break every 15 minutes make everything digestible we can and that's what you do with uh your uh channels as well which everybody should uh subscribe to click the bell to allow notifications and also your website as well digital finance uh, analytics uh, dot com. Dot com. Yep, absolutely. That's where all my posts go and all the all the uh, shows are all up there too. So, no, I've enjoyed it and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, if the past week has shown us uh, anything, consumer behavior is unpredictable. World events, uh, human and non-human origin can, can throw projected economic forecasts uh, at the window. So we're, we've sort of made our analysis now, but in three months' time, it could be something completely different. It'll be wrong and it'll be different, there's no doubt. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Cheers.